What's going on everybody? Austin here back again from Cybersecurity and today we're going to be doing another Threat Hunt Deep Dives video. This is episode 2 and today we're going to be talking about application shimming, which is a Windows persistence technique. Let's get into it. Okay, so your first question when we're talking about application shimming might be, well, what even is a shim? Um, and it's not what's on the left, uh, that is a shiv, which is a prison weapon, so don't get confused. Um, but what's on the right is the physical example of what a shim is. And in real life, a shim is either kind of a thin piece of wood or a thin piece of metal. And usually you shove it between kind of like small cracks or holes and it's used to um, align things if you're working on like some sort of woodworking or, or building project. Um, and this analogy kind of carries over in terms of what is an application shim. And what an application shim is somewhat of the same thing, but it's for software and it's used for compatibility between software. So let's say you created an application and it was for Windows 7, or let's say if it was even further back, like something like Windows XP. If you were trying to load that application on a modern operating system for Windows, like Windows 10, um, you might have some compatibility issues with that piece of software, and it may not load um, because of all the different changes that have happened since then. So instead of having to dig into your code and making lots of changes, uh, maybe you don't want to change your software in that manner, what you can do is you can create an application shim, and then when you load that piece of software, it will load that shim along with it, and that'll make it work on a newer operating system. So there's this thing called the Application Compatibility Framework, or the ACF. Um, it's not, it doesn't come standard installed on Windows operating systems, but it's made by Microsoft, and it can be installed, and then you can use it. And what it can be used for is creating a shim database file. It has this extension called an SDB. Um, and what these shim databases can be used for is when a program is loaded, a, uh, it, it will look inside what's called the import address table or the IAT for these shims, these SDB files. And if it has a shim associated with that application, the shim will get loaded with the application and things can be loaded along with it. So this is a legitimate thing that you can do inside Windows, but it can be abused for a malicious purpose. A threat actor can uh, create a shim file that's not legitimate, load it alongside an application, and it might you know, execute code silently on a system. And this is when we get into talking about what is application shimming. So primarily we're gonna be talking about it in terms of a persistence technique, which is kind of what I just talked about, but it can be used for lots of different other things um, in terms of privilege escalation and, and so many different other things, bypassing the user access control, injecting DLLs, um, disabling Windows Defender, pretty much anything that you can do when an application is loaded, you can load a shim along with it and you can do lots of different abuse. Keep in mind, however, that application shimming does require um, administrator level privileges in order to utilize the um, and utilize STBs and utilize application shimming, um, but it can be used for a slew of different other things. However, what we've seen most threat actors being using this technique for is uh, persistence. That's primarily going to be talking about today. Um, and you can find out more about this technique if you'd like to in the MITRE ATT&CK framework. It's loaded under, I'm sorry, it's filed under T1546 subtechnique 011. All those links will be down in the description. So if you want to check out more about this in depth, you totally can. Um, and, and who's using application shimming? Who's using this persistence technique with these shims? So the big one is um, Fin7, so Financial7. <clears throat> they are a malicious threat actor group that's been targeting the retail space in particular. Um, think restaurants, you know, uh, retail stores, things like that. And they have a software called, um, a, a piece of malware software called Pelomint, and it is loaded maliciously on uh, point of sale systems. And it uses this application shimming technique. So if a point of sale system, like you see uh, down below on the left there, if, if any of those are ever rebooted, it would the Pelament malware would use an application shim in order to uh, load the software back again after a reboot. Um, we've also seen this technique being used by other groups, such as Mofang. They have a remote access trojan that they call, um, that uh, people are calling Shimrat. Um, and Mofang's a, a suspected Chinese uh, group. Um, so it's being used by multiple different threat actors. These are just a few different examples, um, but the big one is uh, Fin7. So now that we've kind of talked about, you know, uh, what application shimming is and who's using it, um, let's go ahead and emulate this technique on systems of our own. Okay, so here I am inside of a Windows 10 virtual machine. And if you'd like to emulate this threat along with me, you need some things that don't come standard on a Windows 10 operating system. So the first one being is that you need the application compatibility framework, 
um, which uh, really what you want is the application compatibility toolkit, the ACT. Um, and what it is part of is the Windows Assessment and Deploy Kit or the Windows ADK. I'm gonna have links for all this stuff down in the description if you wanna emulate this thread along with me. Um, and once you download this uh, Windows ADK for Windows 10, um, it has this application compatibility tools um, along inside of it. Um, and you can decide to selectively choose what you want in here. Um, so you might not need all of these other things. You can decide what you want, but really what we're after is just the application compatibility tools. And once we have that installed, we'll be able to create these application shims. Okay, so once you have the compatibility tools installed, you'll have the compatibility administrator that you can open from the start menu. Um, you have both the 32 and 64 bit version. I'm gonna use the 32 bit version for this example. And within the compatibility administrator uh, tool, this is where you can create these uh, SDB files, the shim databases. Um, so you can see here, um, by default, you'll have a new database already here ready for you within custom databases. I'm gonna go ahead and right click on it and I'll do create new and then I'll do application fix. So this is where I'm doing something that's going to fix an application. Um, in this case, we're not gonna fix it. We're gonna do um, something a little more nefarious to it. Um, but this is where you would do that sort of compatibility type thing. What I'm gonna do is um, I already have a couple of files downloaded here. I went ahead and downloaded uh, putty.exe. Uh, this is a very common SSH utility on Windows, and I went in and downloaded the 32 version already. So the application that I'm gonna fix, doesn't really matter what we name it, but I'll just say Putty, and we'll say Vendor is Putty as well. And I'll go ahead and browse to the location here. See users public is what I'm in, and I'm in this shim testing folder, and here's my 32-bit version of Putty um, here that I'm gonna um, uh, create a shim database file for. So go ahead and click, ne click Next, um, in these compatibility modes, we can just leave this alone, click next. Um, and here in the compatibility fixes, you can see that we have all these different things that we can do for compatibility fixes. What I'm actually gonna do is I'm gonna do something that we talked about um, earlier in the slides before, and I'm gonna do a uh, DLL injection, because right here you can see that inject DLL is one of the options. And this is a very easy way to get persistence is that um, when putty.exe runs, we are going to inject a DLL um, and it'll run when the binary is loaded. So I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give it the path um, to this um, hello world DLL that I've um, already created. Um, so this is somebody else's code here it, um, that I borrowed. It, all it's gonna do is just um, open up a, a message box and it's gonna say hello world. So you can see it's just gonna uh, be titled hello world and say hello world, um, pretty simple. So I'm gonna go ahead and copy the path that it's in. So it's in this, um, see public shim testing and it is called a uh, hello world let me just copy this to make sure that we get it correct here there we go so we go ahead and we have this whole path in here is the command line and that's all we need we're going to click ok um, we can see if we see show selected here um, that we've got the inject DLL and we have the uh, command line path to the DLL that we're gonna load for this shim database. So go ahead and click next. Um, and this matching information, um, it doesn't really matter, you know, if, if you wanna be uh, somewhat, you know, strict about it and make sure that it really works, you can go ahead and um, uncheck all this matching information, but it shouldn't really matter. So go ahead and click finish, and then you'll see that this shim database will be created. It hasn't been saved yet, but you can see that it's got the compatibility fix with inject DLL. Um, with our command line to our DLL and the matching file. So I'll go ahead and click save, and I'll just call our database something like putty inject, doesn't really matter. Um, and then here we already got our path to the shim testing, and I'll call it um, putty inject. And you can see that it's being saved as this SDB um, extension. So if I do a uh, dir here, you can see now we have a putty inject.sdb. That's the shim database file. And the way that we're going to load the shim database file is we're going to use um, uh, sdb inst. So it stands for shim database install. Um, and we'll do the putty inject.sdb. So you can see that it says installation of putty inject complete. So we know that we got this um, correct. And then what I'll do is I will navigate to C. Um, and I could just launch this from the command line, but just to kind of show you, we'll go into the shim testing, and then we'll go ahead and launch this putty.exe. Click run on it, and then you can see it was hidden behind the window here. 
but you can see that it launched this hello world message box. So this is awesome. So anytime that you would run the, the PuTTY program on your system, and you could have done this to any binary. I just happen to use PuTTY as an example, but you could have done this to Microsoft Word. You could have done it to the calculator. You could have done it to any application. You could do it to something that launches by uh, natively on uh, boot on Windows. You could, do, you could have done it to you know explorer.exe and then uh, launch something because explorer.exe is the graphical, um, everything that's controlling your desktop and your, your graphical user interface. Um, so I just did it to putty here and you can see, boom, our message box code, you know, anything that you could write in C++ that's going to throw, that you can put anything you want inside DLL main in there. Um, that code's going to run. So this is just an example. And, and normally what's going to happen is what actors are going to do is they're going to, you know, execute some code that you're not going to see on your system. It may drop a second stage payload, may drop a remote access Trojan, you know, might launch some ransomware, um, or, um, in this case, when we're talking about code persistence, something that's just going to be continually launching on the boot of your system. Um, so that's a demo of, uh, you know, how this technique works, how you can use these shim database files and uh, do some code persistence, launch code when other applications start. Um, now I'm going to show you guys how you can actually hunt for this technique within your environment, how you can stop this from happening. Um, well, not, not, maybe not necessarily stop from happening, but how you can detect it um, using a, a sim platform. Okay, so now that we have emulated this technique on a Windows system of our own, let's talk about what would go into detecting something like this. Um, so here I am in a Splunk instance, and I am looking at Windows event log that we have going to our data, going to our Splunk database. And what we want to detect here is anytime those shim database techniques are being used. And one of the indicators that that's happening is the command line tool that I ran at the end there that installed the shim database file. And what that was was that sdb inst um, tool. So what we want to find here is anytime that um, the sdb inst uh, process is run, and if it ever has a command line in which it's installing one of those .stb extension files. So here I've got new process name. Um, so anytime a new process is spawned with stb inst.exe, and notice I put an asterisk in front here because they might change the path to stb inst. You want to be able to find it anywhere that it is, um, not maybe not just a standard location. And then the process command line, I'm saying that you know anything that comes before this and anything that comes after. And I'm looking specifically for this SDB extension in the process command line string. So all this together is going to get us a, you know, a really close mark to any time the, uh, the shim database install utility is being used to install one of these shims. Keep in mind that this could be being used for legitimate purposes. So if you're using a hunt like this, you know, you're going to have to track down and see, you know, was this being used maliciously or was it um, being used for um, non-nefarious purposes? But I'd say that any time that this triggers, you're going to want to investigate further into what's happening. So you can see here, after I ran this um, command and, I've, and I'm piping it to, you know, a little bit of thing that's, that's pumping out into this nice table here. Um, but you can see that I've got this one detection here. And this is exactly what happened. You can see our process command line is stb inst and the putty inject.sdb. So this is awesome. Our hunt query that we wrote inside Splunk is finding this. Um, and even if we kind of drill into the event a little further, um, we can get a lot more granular detail. So if you're doing, you know, some threat hunting or if you're doing instant response, you know, you'd want to, uh, you know, really look at this, look at these logs and, you know, figure out what's going on, you know, assess the event code. And, you know, you can see that, uh, you know, it was successful, you know, it, it may be that the shim database failed and you saw the log for it because they didn't run it with administrator privilege, privileges. Um, but in this case, you know, uh, the message will tell us that, um, you know, this this was allowed, this SDB inst tool was allowed to run. You can see the process name here and the complete process command line. And of course, if you see something like putty inject.stb, you know, you're, you're probably going to be, uh, you know, want to want to determine what that is. But most likely a nefarious actor is not going to name their SDB file something that looks like it's, you know, totally malicious. They might name it something that might look like it would blend in on a Windows operating system. So, you know, if you're doing instant response here, you're going to want to pull back this SDB file do some inspection on it, do some inspection on these logs and figure out why was there a shim database file installed? What process does it affect? Did it happen on multiple systems? Those sort of things. Um, so that's the first hunt. And, and then I'm going to also show you a, another query that we can do that's going to look for um, these SDB files um, making modifications to the registry. 
Okay, so the other detection that we can do is also when you run the SDB inst command line tool and you install one of these shim databases, it also creates um, registry keys um, that you can use to detect this. Um, so you can see I'm in regedit here and I'm within HKLM, software, Microsoft, um, I believe it's Windows NT, yep, Windows NT, current version, app compat flags, um, and then there's two different um, uh, registry paths within here. One is the uh, custom and the other one is the installed STB. Um, so you can see in custom here, I have a putty.exe and then I have um, what looks like a GUID with an STB here. So if anything ever you know uh, gets created within this uh, custom registry key, we wanna probably get a detection on that. And also in the STB um, inst, if we go in here and we, uh, if we look at this a particular GUID that we're referencing here, this 86 triple C, this whole GUID. Um, this one is actually the putty inject. You can see the database description was the putty inject. Um, and that, that's the actual um, registry key that was associated with this um, STB shim installing. Um, so if I go back here to Splunk, I've already written a query that's gonna detect this very nicely. So what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna, uh, I'm, I'm looking instead, in the last query we were looking in when event logs, this time I'm looking in Sysmon, because it's gonna have more of that granular um, registry key uh, logging that we're looking for. And what I'm looking for is registry path, and then I um, listed both those uh, these registry paths that we're interested in. So this first one is going to that installed SDB and the second one is going to that custom. Um, and also we're gonna wanna make sure that uh, we don't want you know too many false positives. I think you could probably even just get away with leaving this off, but if you wanna be pretty minute about it, you could also say that you're specifically interested in the process path of SDB and stat.exe because that's what's going to be writing these shim database files into uh, these registry paths. Um, so you can see here after I ran it, um, I've got some detections here for both of these registry paths. And if we want to, again, kind of look more fine grain at these particular logs, wait for this to load. And you can see that we've got the sysmon logs here. We can see that it's a create key event type. Um, and we can see that stb inst.exe, you'll probably see this multiple times in the image and the target images. This one's going to that custom um, registry key. And you can see that once again, it's stb inst.exe. So you can get really, you know, really minute into these logs. Uh, maybe the next one is also the uh, stb, uh, the installed stb. Yep. So we have we have both one log for the custom and one log for the installed stb because it's going to write into both those registry keys if you're if you're doing it via this method. Um, so this is another detection that's going to be um, you know really great in terms of you know tracking down this malicious activity. All right, everyone, I just want to say thank you so much for watching. Hope you all learned a lot about application shimming, shims, shim databases, all that sort of jazz. Um, I have a lot of fun making these videos, and I will see you guys all in the next Thread Hunt Deep Dives. Until then.